Gwe de Luisi Charlotte, a Mechahan Jijik Unamagi Leawi, a Nina Migma Akhinu. Hi, I'm Charlotte. Um, I'm from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, and I'm Migma and Inu. Wawa to say Manadi Kwe and Dishnakaz, Bachawana First Nation in Dunjaba, Mong and Dodam, Anishinaabe Kwe and Dao. So my name was gifted to me by my aunties, and it means Spirit Lightning Woman. And my community is Bachawana First Nation, just outside of Sault Ste. Marie. My clan is the Loon Clan, and I'm an Ojibwe woman. I'm Natalie Burton. I, am, uh, I was raised in the Métis, uh, Franco-Métis tradition. Um, I am of Métis, French, and Algonquin, Wescarini, Algonquin descent. Uh, my name in English is Andrew McConnell. Sego, Skunago, Aguigo, Asanaze ni Yung Yats, Ginigihaga nihi nuk wakskare wage. Currently, cultural appropriation is a big topic within Canada as well as the US. It's a very sensitive issue. Things are probably at its height right now. The reason for that, historically, Indigenous people weren't allowed to practice their culture. It was outlawed, and we're just coming into having the ability to, to practice. Actually, it was somewhere around the late 1950s that it no longer was illegal. From that point on, we started to develop and rediscover uh, different aspects of ceremony, different cultural aspects. Because of residential schools, it was beaten out of uh, most of the, uh, the people that attended residential school. They weren't allowed to practice their language, they weren't allowed to practice any ceremony, of course. Their appearance was changed. Everything that made them indigenous, that made them native, was beaten out of them or tortured out of them or in some way uh, they were restricted from being who they actually were. Because of the political climate that we're currently in within Canada and especially because of a, lo a lot of the young people are trying to reclaim their culture, it's become very important for them. When a non-Indigenous person comes to an Indigenous person and asks them to teach their ceremonies or some aspect of their culture, it's really not their place because we need the space in order to recreate our own ceremonies. We're pulling together these puzzle pieces and some of those puzzle pieces are lost and some of them need to be recreated from the elders that are currently around and who have this knowledge. And those elders are, are dying off, they're getting older and it's, it's become an imperative that this this knowledge is passed on to the next generation. So we don't really have the time to, to teach what we currently know to non-Indigenous people. For me, being Indigenous is really all about community because within our relationships with each other, a lot of it is based on you know, mutual respect and community and helping each other. So when you identify as Indigenous, it also means that you have that whole community behind you. And whatever you do, how you act, how you talk, how you kind of carry yourself throughout life, it's all going to be tied back to your community. Your community, your home community, and then your community with the people that you know. Uh, so for me, being Indigenous is about representing your own people and your own community in a good way. For me, I think um, being Anishinaabe, because that's really who I am, uh, is about being connected to my family, being connected to the land, having a re like strong relationships with one another. I think it has to do with kind of getting to understand my culture and my beliefs and being guided by my family members and growing in that understanding. I think that there's not one blanket explanation but it's basically how you live and how you be every single day and that you value your Anishinaabe ways of knowing and being. Being Indigenous means being of the land where you come from, your family, your stories, your history, what you connect to. It means to be me and I'm tied to my space and my place and where I come from and not just who I am but who my family is and who they've been. And, and I will say that a lot of the, you know, the reaffirmation of what are those cultural things that we do really has shown up as I've been growing up.
it was in my 20s um, when all the elders conferences were really becoming very strong. And, and I'm, I've, I really feel that I've been lucky because I've been able to spend time with lots of elders where there are a lot of people out there now who have knowledge to share with younger generations and it's making it easier for them to be Indigenous. One thing that I would like the non-Indigenous community to understand is that we are still here and we are here even if you might not realize it. Not everyone who is Indigenous looks like the stereotype, not everyone looks like those photos of the chiefs that are in black and white or not everyone looks like Pocahontas. We all look different, we all have our own ways of being, our own ways of life and we're all around you um, even if you don't know it and we deserve the same respect as you would treat someone who is non-Indigenous. I think that it's important to understand that we are not all the same, that all of our truths are still truths. I think that um, just because my teachings may differ from another Anishinaabe's person's teachings, that we aren't painted all with the same brush. Like we have, each have our own identity, we have our own belief systems, we have our own teachings, and we aren't one collective group of people. But in saying that there is a unity between nations and us in a way that is undeniable, it's unexplainable, that you just instantly feel almost like a relational connection to people. So, you know, I think about some of my friends who are of different uh, nations. So, for example, like Cree or Mohawk, and I treat them like my brothers and sisters. There's just this level of respect that exists. And it's not instant, but there definitely is a connection of some kind that you can't really explain. But then the, as you grow in your relationship with each other, you kind of build this stronger understanding of one another. And then it's like you become almost protective of them and you ensure that they're treated well and um, you become like a sounding board for them. And it would be similar to a sibling relationship. I think first and foremost, I would want non-Indigenous people to understand that just because we are trying to take back what is rightfully ours, it doesn't mean that we're trying to take anything away from them. There's this fear that if people try to raise themselves up, it means that somebody else has to fall, but that's not it at all. If we all try to raise each other up and build a bigger voice and be allies for one another, then we're all raising each other up. Nobody's losing anything. We aren't going anywhere. We're here. Um, we've been here the whole time. Whether we were seen or noticed or not, we are here. And we're gonna continue to be here. Um, I was speaking with a class literally two weeks ago and one of the students after we'd had lots of conversations about all the things we've gone through as a people and this, one of the students put her hand up and said, do you think indigenous people will survive? And I kind of looked at her and it was like, well, of course, you know, we survived a genocide, we survived the pressures, we've survived all of the things that have tried to make us conform to be like everybody else. And as much as we have changed, we still maintain who we are. We still have our stories, our connections, our families, our ties to the land and the spaces and places we come from. And as long as we have our children and are able to pass those things on to our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, we will always be here. For me, the most important social issue is probably the mental health crises that are happening on reserves, specifically the ones back home. Uh, so one of my communities, Eskosoni, we have a very big suicide crisis that's going on. And there are, I think, dozens of youth that have taken their lives in the past few years. Um, and our community is pretty small too. So really focusing on making sure that our youth are, are doing well and they have those resources to support themselves and to get well if they're not doing well. Um, that's really important for me because as Indigenous people, we have a lot of trauma that's with us, that we carry with us, um, things that's intergenerational, things that's just happening to us all the time. And we don't get the same support specifically on reserves as uh, non-Indigenous communities do. So it's really important for us to work on that as a community and make sure everyone 
can be mentally well. Uh, one of the issues that I, I like to bring or shed some light on is the water issue that we have. So many people in York Region don't realize that Lake Simcoe is heavily polluted, that they are looking to put a sewage plant in, and that Georgina Island has been on a boil water advisory for a while. So this is one of our local neighboring communities who attend school with our York Region school board kids, right? So I think that people have no idea that that close of a community has a boil water advisory. And even though there are water treatment plants that are um, on schedule to be put into these communities, it actually won't be large enough to reach the entire community. So there's a lot of misinformation in terms of um, how they are helping the problem and a lot of uh, half-truths in terms of what's really happening. For me personally, um, for me it's about land and connection to land, not, not buying real estate. It's, a, it's about the waters, it's about the health of, of, because we need to leave things for the next seven generations and each generation needs to work on that, leaving things in a healthy way so that the next se seven generations can thrive. Our children, it's the single most important thing. Um, the health and well-being of our children and those children knowing who they are and where they come from. As long as we know who we are and where we come from, we remain. And so the biggest social issue for us is the health and well-being of our children and them knowing who they are. Cultural appropriation, it's a really hard topic to talk about, especially for non-Indigenous people, specifically white people, to wrap their heads around it because for us, our culture and our regalia and our artwork and all of those things that our communities have, they're really important to us and they have a lot of meaning. And when they're appropriated um, by people who don't know those meanings and who just want to have those things to look cool or to do whatever it is with them, it's really offensive because to us those things hold personal connections and personal ties but for them it's just something that they can take off um, and it's really offensive for us to see that because you have like mascots or team logos or all that that tokenize our cultures and use it as something to look cool but for us we're people too and we don't want to be dehumanized to that point where it's just something to make you look pretty and all of that. Cultural appropriation People like to use the word appreciation almost in a way that they're synonyms. And so in that vein, they don't like to um, acknowledge that they are appropriating another culture. But in 2019, we know more. We know that part of the TRC's calls to action are to provide space and voice for Indigenous people to speak on behalf of themselves. And so I think it is time to shine a light on our cultures, our traditions, our artistry in a way that promotes us. So we should never be copying a style of an artist. We should really be inviting our artists in and getting to know who they are in terms of their indigeneity and getting to know how they've come to um, create the pieces that they create and kind of almost light a fire in little kids' artists' abilities that help them see who they are as an artist, but not in a way that copies someone else's styles. And I think one of the best projects I ever worked on, I could, our artists worked with students in our board, and then they created their own pieces, and they didn't look like the artist's pieces, but I could see elements of the artist present I could tell who worked with Darren based on kind of like the airy flowness of the student's artwork, but in no way did they copy his style of it. So it was kind of really neat to watch that. And I think one of my favorite parts was when kids were deconstructing the learning and what they had learned from all of the artists we had invited. The key points for me were they said that they learned that Indigenous people are a culture of gratitude that they always ensure that their story or their lived experience is showing through their art and that they always um, start and end every day um, in a good way. And so I thought that you can't teach anybody anything better than that. 
and it's not about a style of art but it was really about lighting fires in these artists to kind of put themselves back into their stories of artistry. Cultural appropriation is the idea that you can simply be inspired by something and take it as your own. And what a lot of Indigenous artists are fighting for now is to, ha to prevent having their, uh, their artwork and their style um, and the culture taken from them. It's not just about that, but also trying to show non-Indigenous people that they can be authentic in their own self. So cultural appropriation isn't just about, you know, I try, to, I try not to make it just about the theft of something, because I think there's an awful lot of people who are talking about the theft of culture, but they're not talking about, well, how do we help raise these people up as well? Let's, let's show you that there is value in your own culture and that you have a way to express yourself authentically with your own culture and your own means and your own tools rather than ripping something off. You can be inspired by indigenous culture, but rather than just taking it and regurgitating it, that it's not yours, instead be inspired by it, but come from it from your own place. I find the whole concept really interesting because if you say plagiarism, people understand that emphatically. They know, you know, when you're writing something and you're using ideas from somebody else that you need to, you know, make a proper citation as to where it came from, who was the author, how does it come into your work, where do you do it? It seems strange to me that the idea that you can somehow take somebody's imagery or style and therefore use it as your own without paying any sort of respect to where it came from, um, I, I don't see the difference between the two. It's taking and it's, you know, it's, it, we understand copyright laws really well. Why is you know, the idea that you could take and use something that comes from a group of people um, any different than if you take or use something that comes from an individual? It's plagiarism, it's theft, it's breaking copyright if you have to. I know that the Navajo have literally copywritten major parts of their culture and designs so that people can't use it because they figured out that that's the best way to deal with it in the United States. I find it kind of crazy because it doesn't make sense. It's, you know you're taking, it's not yours. Self-indigenizing uh, is something that I've noticed a lot happening um, within the past few years, and especially in my community, the Mi'kmaq community, there's a lot of uh, quote-unquote Eastern Métis people that are coming up and claiming Indigenous ancestry even though um, they don't have, like, real tangible records of those or they don't have those community ties or they don't have they don't have an interest in the culture they are just doing identifying to you know look cool because it's trendy now right um so people who self-indigenize uh or kind of claim that indigenous identity without those community ties um it's really harmful to actually indigenous people because you know we have those community ties we have all, all of that culture that comes with it and we're trying really hard to be recognized ourselves as indigenous people and when someone comes in who doesn't know anything about that or who's just claiming it for their own self gain it takes away from the work that we're trying to do because they're coming in and they're being like hey look at me I'm there's like a big trend where people want to be oppressed now. They're like, look at me, I'm native, I'm oppressed. And that's a trendy thing, it's cute for them because it's something that they can also take off. They chose to put that indigenous label onto them. They, they're choosing to kind of go about in that way, in that way that isn't authentic. Whereas for us, we have to carry those burdens every single day and it's not something we can take off and it's not something that we're doing to be cool. It's something that's really important to our families and really important to our people. I think about self-indigenization. I'm also brought to a space of how people self-claim indigeneity and I always am a bit leery when people will come up to me and say my great 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 grandmother is also Cree. So I'm looking into that. So I always say to people, you need to spend time in figuring out what that means in terms of your own indigeneity. 
I don't think that it gives you some kind of claim to be able to speak on behalf of a group because you don't really know what that means for yourself. But even more importantly, like you almost have to have a community that claims you. And I know for some people they really struggle with that because I understand history with um, the 60s scoop and foster care and how ki our kids were removed from their homes. But at the same time, lineages run deep and there is somebody who knows your auntie or your great auntie in a community and if you can kind of um, get to a space of almost geographically mapping the area somebody knows your auntie like it's very rare that i've seen um, where people have not really found a connection but they ha you have to spend the time and you have to invest the energy in getting to know people and it comes back to that relationship piece but the one part that I think I struggle with is being in Anishinaabe, I will never speak on behalf of my Cree brothers and sisters, my Métis brothers and sisters, because that's not my identity, that's not my teachings. And so I always ensure that I stay in my own lane of Anishinaabe-ness um, without kind of speaking on behalf of anybody else. Being of the Métis tradition, um, yeah, I see it all the time because there's an awful lot of people who are like me, s grappling with regaining our culture. Um, and so part of that is being a person who didn't get to grow up directly because of colonization or for one reason or another, we didn't get to live with our traditions growing up. And so we are relearning and reconnecting and trying to figure out where we belong and where we fit in within our culture. Um, so it's basically taking our culture back. So for some of us it's that. For others who have been lucky enough to have the culture growing up, or at least some of it, it's about sharing it with those who didn't have it growing up.